Secretary speaking English because it is a special for everybody. And not the chairman of this section, uh, but uh, if my voice is not. No, okay. it's not <laughs> Okay, uh, there is a small surprise for Emily, uh, because uh, as uh, some of you know, there are a special recognition made by the president of the Italian Chemical Society for uh, special guests uh, and distinguished scientists, which is the gold sigillo, sigillum of the Italian Chemical Society, and uh, this time uh, I, because I am the president, decide to give it to... <laughs> no, no, there is a scientific commission about that, I'm joking. But anyway, that's for you, and is uh, dedicated to you. It is the only one uh, with the name and uh, the occasion for the dedication. Thank you. Um, The second thing is not a tie, <laughs> but it, it, it is a different thing for you. Yeah. And I let uh, Chiara to chair the section. Yeah, thank you. So let's pass to the scientific session and then uh, Professor Carter, who will tell us about mechanism of photoelectrochemical reduction of carbon dioxide and water splitting from first principles. Please. Thank you. So uh, first I'd like to thank Enzo very much for the invitation and the other organizers. I know how much work it is to, uh, to put together a meeting and I'm appreci very appreciative. Am I talking too fast? Can you, can you manage? Okay, you let me know. Wave your hands if I, if I talk too fast uh, because I will, I will naturally talk fast but I'm happy to talk slower if, it's, if it helps. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is tell you uh, uh, about work that's been going on in, in my group for uh, all four years, I would say, maybe a little longer, uh, four or five years. And, uh, and it's part of a larger portfolio of projects that are all devoted to trying to get, uh, to help the planet get off of fossil fuels. Um, and that's, of course, a tall order, as, as all of us know. Um, but this is the, the set of projects. This is actually two of, out of eight projects I have going on that are related to uh, the chemical part of the problem, namely uh, the issues associated with making either fuel precursors, well, really fuel precursors that would take us to fuel from sunlight. So it's really important that we think about um, what are the important properties in a device, and in particular in the materials in the device, that would be necessary for us to try to optimize, hopefully from first principles, uh, to, uh, to get us to be able to say that we can cheaply and efficiently convert sunlight into a fuel precursor. So um, what I have shown here is a, is a, is a photoelectrochemical cell and the issues that we're interested in really have to do with the fact that um, we have, uh, if we're going to absorb sunlight, we have to have, of course, a band gap uh, to absorb sunlight across. And so in this picture, what we have are two semiconductors, potentially, one for an anode and one for a cathode that would absorb sunlight. And at, at the anode, one hopes to uh, split water to make oxygen. Um, just like we heard this morning um, what Photosystem 2 knows how to do. Uh, by the way, my goal in life is not to mimic plants, uh, even though I take inspiration from them, because plants actually are very inefficient at photosynthesis. They, they, they didn't, you know, derive them, they, they didn't decide uh, that their goal in life was to optimize that process. Their goal in life is to make sure they live. And so, um, and so it's not a very efficient process. But the fundamental processes involved, uh, in, in principle, can be reproduced in an inorganic system. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, as well, we'll get also to something that involves organic as well. But the point is that you need a semiconductor that's going to absorb light, and it will create electron hole pairs. Uh, and the holes will oxidize water to produce oxygen, and the electrons, if they have enough free energy, will be able to take CO2, which you can't see, there's a two there, uh, with uh, enough protons, for example, to methanol. It would be nice to go all the way to a liquid uh, fuel precursor like methanol. If we can make methanol, 
there are known zeolite catalysts, the mobile process that takes us from methanol to gasoline. And so um, that's, that's what we're aiming for. So the idea is to, to use quantum mechanics to scan key properties um, and to be able to calculate electronic excited states well in solids, a non-trivial task, uh, to, to be able to describe charge transport, both electron and hole transport. So the idea is you, you, th you break down the process. Photons come in, you make, you make an excited state, then those electrons and holes have to separate and you need to be able to understand how, can that electron and hole pair, can it live long enough to separate or does it just re-radiate down, uh, down to the ground state? That's a problem, you don't want that. So it's important to be able to calculate the lifetimes of, of those excited states. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then also to look at, at, the, at the mobility of these charge carriers, the electrons and holes. And so that's the charge transport. It's also important to establish where the band edges are, band edges meaning the conduction band minimum, Okay, so that's here, conduction band minimum, and the valence band maximum here and here, because that's going to determine the free energy associated with the hole and the electron. And where that, that, free, that free energy tells us, will tell us thermodynamically if we have enough energy to undergo redox reactions. That's, that's critical. So we need to understand where those positions are, determine them on an absolute scale with respect to the vacuum level outside of a, uh, outside of a solid surface, and then we can compare that to the redox potentials, the redox free energies associated with the reactions that we're interested in. And then, of course, to look actually explicitly at the surface redox chemistry, um, both thermodynamically and ultimately uh, in terms of the kinetics. So that's what we're, th what we're attempting to do. Um, and we've been looking mostly at heterogeneous processes, but also homogeneous processes. Because of the limited time, even though the abstract mentioned it, I don't know, I was, I was definitely in a, in a fog when I wrote the abstract because I didn't realize. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to talk about the homogeneous chemistry. There are some uh, references you can read about the, the rhenium work that we're doing in collaboration with Cliff Kubiak's group at UC San Diego. Um, but I will talk about water oxidation, and I'll talk about CO2 reduction on gallium phosphide that's in collaboration with Andy Bacarsley's group at Princeton, so two experimentalists. None of this work could have been done without really outstanding graduate students and postdocs. The ones in blue are just in blue because they're still with me. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to talk very briefly about some of Martina's work, uh, but these other two, I'm not, I, I didn't have room to talk about their work, but uh, I, I'm listing all the other people who've either gotten PhDs with me or who were postdocs with me, who've now moved on to other positions. Uh, and I'm pr mostly going to talk about the work of, of John Keith, a uh, little bit about Leah Isseroff's work, a little bit about Dalal Cannon's uh, work, some, a little bit of Meital Taroka's work, a uh, non-trivial amount of Pauline Liao's work, and also some of um, Ana Munoz Garcia, who is in the audience right there. Okay, so, and this work is uh, funded by the Department of Energy in the U.S. as well as the Air Force through two different grants. The Air Force, why would the Air Force fund this? They need fuel, okay? So, um, and I should point out, uh, there was a talk earlier which I liked very much about, about um, photosynthetic processes to produce hydrogen. I think it's really important to, to point out that hydrogen is a lousy fuel, okay? Um, I, I think it's incredibly important to produce renewable hydrogen. Why? Because it, there are so many industrial processes that involve hydrogen. And right now, hydrogen comes from fossil fuels. And so it's incredibly important to have a renewable source that can displace the, the use of fossil fuels to create hydrogen. Uh, in addition, all the production of liquid fuels from biomass involves a tremendous amount of hydrogen. Again, so if we can have a renewable source of hydrogen as a fuel precursor, not as the fuel, okay, there are just lots of problems that we can talk about, about why hydrogen's not a, bad, uh, not a good choice for a fuel. Number one, it's a gas, okay. Uh, so anyway, but nevertheless, very important to still do water splitting to produce hydrogen renewably. Okay, so um, I want to just bring you up to speed on the processes again a little bit to say that if you look at actually all the solar energy conversion processes, either to make electricity or to make fuels, 
either in a photovoltaic for electricity, photoelectrochemical cell, like I showed on the previous slide, or just a photocatalyst by itself. They all involve the same you know, uh, elementary steps. You absorb light, you create, separate, and move electron hole pairs um, to produce either current or fuel, or fuel and current, potentially, to do uh, in, the, in the photoelectrochemical cell or the photocatalysis. Um, so this is just to wake everybody up. So you have a, a little photocatalyst particle and you have sunlight coming in, creating an electron hole pair that has to migrate to the surface. And then the electron, uh, the electron can be used to reduce CO2 in the presence of water as a source of protons. And the holes, holes can be used to, to strip electrons off of water and produce um, O2. So that's what we're after. But the point is that despite, uh, you know, uh, people like uh, Dan Nocera and others making statements that, that we have good catalysts. The fact is we don't have any efficient catalysts yet. Okay? And the reason is that it's a very hard problem. There are so many different things that have to be optimized. And in fact, I've been talking, I live in an engineering school and I've been talking to uh, engineers who say, you know, maybe that you can't solve this problem all with one material. It may be we have to have coupled processes. And, and so, you know, there's lots of room to work on various aspects of this problem. It's a really rich problem. So the reason that there are no efficient catalysts is because there are lots of constraints beyond those for photovoltaics. So photovoltaics, you need an optimal band gap of about one and a half EV. Um, you need uh, long electron hole pair lifetimes. Those are the main things that you want to, to optimize for photovoltaics. But in the case of photocatalysis, you have these other thermodynamic constraints. And so you have, again, the valence band and the conduction band in a semiconductor, and you have to place those band edges, like I said before, at energies such that the free energy of the electrons and the holes straddle in some way the, the reaction free energies that you're interested in for the electrochemical reactions. Otherwise, thermodynamics says no, you're not going to be able to do it. And of course, that's not enough because there can be barriers to the reactions, okay? So, because this is only about thermodynamics. So what we have been looking at is um, first row transition metal oxides because, again, if we think about a practical solution, the practical solution has to be something that is cheap, okay? And, it's, and, and, so, and yet it has to be a good catalyst. And so something which is cheap is, is a first row, not a second or third row transition metal. They're too expensive. And the oxides, of course, are cheap because they, they're roughly what you get out of a rock. Okay, I mean, that's, that's trivializing it in the sense that you, of course, need to purify it, but it's much cheaper than having to, to try to form platinum metal, for example, right? So um, they also, unlike, uh, you know, organics, they, they are ultraviolet and, uh, light and corrosion resistant, so you don't have to worry about, about bonds breaking and the, and the material de um, degrading, but they're inefficient. Okay, and, and it has to do with the electronic structure, actually, as to why they're so inefficient. So what we've been doing is looking at, can we take you know, parent materials, the, the, um, the normal transition metal oxides, and either alloy them together uh, or dope them in such a way that we can tune all of these properties that I've mentioned here. And so, so what we're trying to do is offer up ideas to experimentalists as to what they should use, what, what they should go and try to make uh, in the laboratory based on what we calculate from quantum mechanics. So then the question is, okay, what parent materials to start with? And you might, you might say immediately titania, because there's been a lot of work, right, on titania. And I would immediately say to you, no, okay? Um, because I have another idea, uh, which actually I guess it will be shown on the next slide, as to why one should not be looking at titania. But I can tell you right away, titania by itself, and it's why you add dyes to titania, titania by itself is no good because it has a band gap in the ultraviolet. Okay, And so that means immediately that you have reduced the upper bound on your efficiency of any one of these processes to the amount of light that is absorbed in the ultraviolet. That's 2 to 3 percent of the solar spectrum. Okay, So then you're down to the level of what a plant does. A plant efficiency for, so for photosynthesis is about 2 percent, 2 to 3 percent. That, that's not acceptable to me. You need to be looking at visible light absorbers because that's where most of the energy in the solar spectrum is. Um, and so, uh, so that's what we're going to try to be focusing on in terms of the band gap. 
But what I wanted, since this is a theory audience, I have this slide in here to talk about how we actually calculate all these different metrics. Okay, and there's no one method for sure that can do everything. We all know that. And so unfortunately, you have to mix and match a bit. So in terms of the material structure, um, we use density functional theory. We use DFT plus U uh, for these transition metal oxides because these are mostly mid to late transition metal oxides, first row transition metal oxides, and DFT itself fails miserably. It can, it can basically, you know, essentially take a semicon something that should be an honest semiconductor and, and, describe, and if you apply DFT, there's no gap. Okay, that's a huge problem. And it's because of the self-interaction and delocalization error, error that exists in, uh, in standard exchange correlation functionals. DFT plus U, as we heard earlier today, can actually fix that problem to some degree without adding uh, an enormous amount of expense. It doesn't always work. So sometimes for some of these systems, we have to go beyond that and use hybrid functionals. Um, in, in the hybrid functionals, as I'm sure many of you know, are we, in our hands, we see it's about two orders of magnitude more expensive than DFT plus U. So that's, uh, you, you, so you use it very carefully <laughs> and don't use it all the time. Uh, but the idea is you, you need a method that can give you the ground state properties well, and that's what these methods can do. Uh, and they can tell you about the band edge character, not the band edge positions for sure, We'll talk about that in a second, but the band edge character. So the point is, it tells you whether or not the hole is going to live on an oxygen or a metal, um, and, and vice versa, and what kind of, of orbital it's going to live in. And so and those are, those, that turns out to be very important. OK. In terms of the band gap, um, don't let anybody tell you you can use those methods by themselves to get a band gap. If you get the right answer, you're getting the right answer for the wrong reason. Because in fact, the eigenvalue gap, which you get from DFT, um, hybrid DFT, DFT plus U, whatever, is not related to an observable. The observable you can get using Green's function methods. And so if you use, for example, the GW approximation, that is exactly identical to calculating the photo emission, inverse photo emission gap, or what's called the fundamental gap, um, which can be measured. Okay, so that's a nice thing to, to do, um, and, and that's what we use. And oftentimes that gap um, is very close. It's, it, in almost all cases, it's very close to the optical gap, within about a tenth of an EV, and that's certainly within the error of what we're doing anyway. So this is what we use to get the, the, the actual observable of the band gap. We also do calculations of optical excitations using embedded correlated wave function approaches. I'm not going to talk about that. I don't have time. Uh, I'll give you one example of looking then at once you form this excited state, how do you calculate the transport? We use uh, uh, embedded cluster models um, using either unrestricted hartree fock or, or CAS SCF calculations and a small Polaron model, which is essentially, that's what physicists call Marcus theory. Okay, so we use Marcus theory to get, uh, to get Marcus curves to estimate mobilities for these charge carriers. The work function of, of, uh, of a material, in fact, is what we use to, to set where those band edges are. So we can, we can do a DFT plus U or a hybrid DFT calculation on a slab, a periodic slab, and we can calculate the, the vacuum level, which basically gives us the work function, the vacuum level of an electron, so an, the, val the, the value of the electrostatic potential in vacuum compared to the band gap center for a, an undoped semiconductor. That's precisely how you define the work function. And then you can use that with the uh, quasi-particle gap, the, the GW gap, to define precisely where the, the absolute positions of the band uh, edges are. And so that's, that's how we get the, the band edges. Um, and then we're doing surface redox chemistry with DFT plus U. Um, event, and we're also doing uh, embedded cluster calculations. And I'll show you some of that, I hope, if I end up having time. So which materials to consider? So this is the slide I wanted to, to mention, which is that when I was writing my first grant proposal on this, I was trying to think, OK, what, what, what ideas can I have about how to rationalize what materials to use? And one idea that I had was, was to um, think about how to uh, minimize the chance that an electron or a hole will get trapped on a transition metal cation in a transition metal oxide. And so the idea is that in these transition metals, as uh, was pointed out in the, the um, young woman's talk today who was looking at the manganese dimer, 
those manganese atoms, they're all high spin, right? And, and then they're antiferromagnetically coupled. But the point is that whenever you have high spin transition metals, uh, then it, it's actually very unfavorable to take away one of those electrons, which would happen if a hole annihilated the electron, or to add an electron that somehow destroys that, because you lose exchange interactions between those high spin electrons. And so there are certain configurations for which that will not be true, okay? Uh, sorry, for, that, that will in fact not want to trap an electron, and then there are others that, that will want to trap an electron. So for example, if I have a D4 or a D9 case of a transition metal, there's gonna be a huge driving force to add an electron and trap it at D5. You know that a, a half-filled shell or a filled shell of a transition metal is very stable, and it's because of these exchange interactions. So the point is, you don't want to be in a situation where you're, where you're dealing with D4 or D9 uh, transition metal cations. On the other hand, if you have a half-filled shell or a filled shell, those are very stable in terms of the exchange interactions. There will be no driving force to trap an electron or to trap a hole. So, it's, so it was with this, this insight that um, I, I decided what we need to do is focus on materials that have that property. And so that includes manganese oxide, uh, hematite, iron oxide, and cuprous oxide. So I'm going to show you some examples using those oxides. So here, here is the same kind of picture you saw before in terms of, of the issues that we're dealing with. And I have um, an outdated picture uh, compared to what we saw earlier today in the very nice talk um, uh, by uh, you, okay, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Um, and, and, uh, but this is a, a picture of the oxygen evolving center in Photosystem II dated more than, before 2011, okay, but it's, it's roughly right. And, uh, and so what you can see here, as was pointed out in the talk earlier, is that you have this really interesting cuboid structure that is basically manganese oxide. And in fact, in the, in the crystal, you have a rock salt structure of, of manganese oxide. And so uh, be, not being a, a, a bio person, I said, well, let's look at that. Since that's the active center, why not look at manganese oxide, OK, and see what happens? Well, th there's a big problem. Manganese oxide is worse than titania in terms of its band gap. OK, it absorbs in the UV, in the deeper UV. So that's, that's not good in terms of absorption. So the question is, can I mix it with something that might reduce its gap without changing its fundamental properties in terms of having the band edges in the right place? And so, um, in fact, what we found is that if you mix manganese oxide with zinc oxide, then it, you can bring it down into the visible range, okay, into, into the green. And so um, this... Uh, this paper, by the way, in 2011, describes the method that I had talked about for how we get the band edges um, properly. And, and essentially what it shows here is that this is pure manganese oxide, and as I mix in zinc oxide, um, I can get down into the visible range. And I, we have other examples, uh, you know, looking actually at nickel oxide and, and, uh, and uh, mixing in lithium oxide, and it does the same kind of thing. So you can play this, this engineering game to get the, the, the band uh, gap down to the region you want. So that's good. I've got good, probably good light absorption. That's, it's not enough of what I've shown here, but it could have reasonable light absorption. So now I want to worry about transport. And so this is just one example, switching materials here, looking at hematite, iron oxide. And this is actually very old data showing um, that if you dope hematite, uh, so-called N-doping, because I'm adding something that's a group four, hematite is, is iron three, so if I think about this, what's happening is the iron atom is donating three electrons to the lattice. So I have iron three plus, and then three electrons that are going to the oxygens. If I substitute a, a, a group four element, I'm adding one extra electron to the, to the lattice. So it becomes N-doped, okay? And, and so uh, that's what was going on here. And what you can see, the only thing you need to see is that the photocurrent, which is a measure of how much um, how good the conductivity is when I shine light on hematite is very high for silicon and is, is, is almost non-existent for titanium. And so what we set out to do was to try to understand that 
and we use this small polaron or Marcus theory uh, approach with combined with, with, um, with embedded clusters to look at Marcus curves that you could generate for electrons in, um, in, in hematite where there was a titanium nearby. And what you can see is that this is energy as a function of the generalized Marcus co um, re reaction coordinate. And what you can see is that there's a very deep well here, and that deep well is for the, for the electron to sit on titanium. So titanium traps carriers, and that's, that explains what's going on there. What's not clear is, is why silicon is so much better. And so we did the case of silicon, and it's completely reversed. The electron does not want to sit on silicon. This is silicon. It wants to stay on the iron. And so that's beautiful, because what it says is the silicon donates an extra charge to the, to the lattice. That's a good thing, because the conductivity is proportional to the number of charge carriers you have. So the conductivity goes up linearly with the, with the dopants then. And, and it doesn't trap. So the question is why. I mean, I, I always tell my students, I don't want to know a number. I want to know why. Okay, because knowing a number doesn't tell you anything about the future, about how to make a prediction. So the reason why comes about if you start to look at the density difference plots associated with what happens to the, electron, the, the density when I add an electron to this particular case. And that's what's shown here. And what you can see, actually, maybe, is that it's adding an electron to an antibonding orbital. There's a node in that picture. And so what's happening is the reason it, it costs so much to add an electron to silicon here is because you have a much more covalent bond between silicon and oxygen than you do between titanium and oxygen. And so you have, you're effectively adding an electron to an antibonding orbital, and that's very unfavorable. So it, it brought up then, that understanding brought up a design principle, which is to say that if you dope a material with, a, with an element that can form more covalent bonds to oxygen, that you will add, uh, you'll add these carriers, you'll add electrons without trapping, because you'll create states that look like this, which the electron will never go. It'll stay on the iron, and that's what we want, OK? Because we know the iron doesn't trap, because it's iron 3, D5, OK? So that's the kind of principle that we're try trying to use to help optimize these materials. Um, switching now, we, we looked at the excitation, the band gap, we looked at, we looked at transport, and now um, my student, Pauline Lau, in her, in her culminating work for her PhD thesis, looked at water oxidation. Um, and this is for undoped hematite for the basal plane. That's the lowest energy, one of the lowest energy planes. And uh, you probably can't see that. It's, it's a catalytic cycle um, looking at uh, how the cumulative change in free energy as I go around the cycle. I'm sorry that, that it's probably not very visible. Um, over here are the main results. First of all, it's important to validate that this is DFT plus U. You know, do, does it do okay in calculating um, known quantities such as uh, the known um, reduction, redox potential for water splitting, which is 1.23 volts? And, you know, this is PBE um, for the exchange correlation. It does. Uh, you know, too good of a job, okay? 1.1 versus 1.2 volts for the water splitting. Um, now, if we run that reaction on the surface of, of hematite, we find that there's an overpotential, which is the difference between what we calculate on the surface and what it should have been, okay, of about 0.6 volts. So that's um, that, or 0.7 volts. And the experimental overpotential is in the same range, so we're doing okay. I mean, this is not spectroscopic accuracy, but it's, it's, it's acceptable. Um, and so then what we did, that was sort of validation, is to run all those calculations, but then for a whole series of different dopants that would exist at the surface. And, what, um, and then we, we plotted what's known in the catalytic literature as a volcano plot. So looking at, essentially, the fastest reaction is at the, is, is at the top. And so the prediction was that nickel and cobalt doping should, in fact, help um, a hematite to, uh, to split water better, to, to oxidize water. And in fact, right as we, were, we had submitted the paper, we found out that there was a paper that came out at the same time um, that showed exactly that for nickel. Okay? So it shows that, that we can um, use these kinds of techniques to get you know, good um, predictions that, that um, at least in this case, were, were confirmed. And I understand there's also been now work on cobalt showing the same thing. So 
Um, moving on, I mentioned, so we talked about manganese oxide, hematite. Now I'll talk about cuprous oxide a little bit. This is showing a, a schematic of, of how we calculate that work function. So this is a periodic slab of cuprous oxide. We calculate the electrostatic potential. We calculate the vacuum potential. Compare it to the band gap center. The difference between those two is the work function. It also, it sets for us relative to the vacuum potential. It sets where the band edges are. And using that, in this case, we have to, for cuprous oxide, to get really accurate results, you have to use a hybrid functional. Here we used HSE functional. And, and, uh, and we can set the band edges then using, again, GW on top of this case, uh, the, the, the HSE functional, the GGA functional. This is showing the experiment. And so it's, it's in a, a reasonable range. And this is then showing the, um, the reaction free energies associated with different ways of reducing CO2 or, or water. And so it shows that all these reactions actually should work very well with, um, with cuprous oxide, but it's known that it's very inefficient. It's actually been used in, in photovoltaic cells, and the, the efficiency is this, is this very frustrating 2%. And it's due to the fact that there's low conductivity. So we decided to explore why that was. And this is the work of Leah Isaroff. And, um, and so what, what we recognized is that in cuprous oxide, it's well known, that it's naturally p-type. And, and how that happens is it has copper cation vacancies. So you, have a, you pull out a copper cation, but to keep neutrality, there has to be a hole wandering around, okay, a positive charge in the lattice. So that's an intrinsic defect. And it seems that those vacancies um, are, uh, uh, are they, they are thought to create traps, essentially, for electrons going through this. That's the minority carrier in this case. And so Leia started looking at cuprous oxide and calculating um, two different structures for vacancies, uh, just moving, taking a copper out of the lattice, making a simple vacancy, or you, can, you find that there's another structure which is called a split vacancy, where one of the copper atoms moves over and gets uh, tetrahedrally coordinated and forms this, this other structure. And she did very careful calculations under all sorts of different conditions to show that the simple vacancy is actually more stable than the split vacancy, but not by very much. So this is the st statistics of all the different configurations she used um, by 0.2 EV. Uh, and so, you know, under the synthesis conditions of cuprous oxide, for sure, both are going to be present. And so then the question is, you know, which one of these, uh, you know, is, is leading to the trapping of the electrons? And so Leia went and looked at the electronic structure very carefully of both of these, um, these, these uh, uh, defects. And what, what you can see here is that um, we have the simple vacancy here, and we have the split vacancy here. And what you're seeing is the, is the density associated with the hole in yellow. And what you can see is that the hole in, for, the, for the simple vacancy is much more delocalized, whereas for the split vacancy, it's localized on a copper atom. And so the point is that if, it, if it's localized, that, that, that um, hole is essentially trapped. It, and whereas this one is much more consistent with a normal semiconductor, p-type semiconductor. And so, um, so this guy is the culprit, we believe, in terms of, of the, um, the, the trap state. And you can actually also see that that split vacancy um, has a very narrow peak above the Fermi level that is, um, that is this, this essentially deep trap state that we need to get rid of. And so Leia went on and then looked at various dopants to see what could work in terms of getting rid of that, of that, uh, of that split vacancy. And she found that, in fact, by introducing, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go a little faster because I wanna make sure that I, that I have time to talk about uh, the, the CO2 reduction, um, that, that if you introduce a, um, a dopant, you can essentially replace this copper by the dopant, that's what ends up happening. It goes into this tetrahedral state where you no longer have trap states. And so it says that it's a prediction, and in fact, um, uh, an experimentalist at Caltech, um, who you may know, Nate Lewis, is, is looking into whether or not this um, at doping with lithium can improve cuprous oxide, okay, uh, to improve its photoconductivity. 
So with that, I want to uh, spend the last bit of time talking about the CO2 reduction. Um, so this process of taking CO2 to methanol is a six electron reduction, and in principle, takes you from CO2 to methanol via formic acid and formaldehyde, potentially. And the best known system to date is, is one uh, by my colleague in Princeton in the chemistry department, uh, who, uh, Andy Bacarsley, who has shown that with, uh, with P-doped ga gallium phosphide electrodes, um, that you basically are completely selective to making methanol. Um, and there's no overpotential, which is quite amazing. But the problem is that the efficiency is very poor. And that's why you know, it's good to do uh, fundamental science to understand the mechanism. And so uh, in principle, thermodynamically, CO2 to methanol should take place at minus half a volt versus the saturated cal calomel electrode. But it's known that in general, high overpotentials are needed, um, except for this system with, with gallium phosphide and light. So what Andy, Andy had the insight to add an electrocatalyst. He added pyridine in the presence of acidified water. And his idea was that, in fact, um, that this pyridinium could act as a shuttle uh, for, for electrons. Because he had measured that the pyridinium reduces um, to form what he thought was pyridinyl uh, at about the same uh, reduction potential. Okay? And so his idea was he, he wrote out a schematic saying, okay, I have pyridine and CO2, and somehow maybe they come together through this pyridinyl, and eventually he could, he could you know, push electrons around to, to, uh, to eventually make methanol and regenerate pyridine. And so um, that's Andy's lab, by the way. Um, and so the question is, we, we wanted to look at this very closely because this, this is a very strange object, okay? This is completely isoelectronic with benzene, so uh, this is a, a very happy molecule, but now imagine you're adding an electron to benzene, okay? So the question is, uh, how, how easy is it really to reduce pyridinium to pyridinyl? Um, and can this, this, this very strange beast here actually undergo a reaction to make this and then eventually make methanol? And so uh, we wanted to understand, you know, it, is it really the case that you could make pyridinyl uh, and how easy is it, in, if, once you make it, to, you, to insert CO2, the idea was that this guy may deprotonate and then add CO2 to, to an anion. So the question is, you know, how easy could, this, uh, could pyridinyl actually deprotonate? And then what's the barrier to actually go from here to here? Um, and you know, does the, cat, the catalysis happen in solution? Because for 15 years, An Andy had been writing that it, that it does happen in solution. Or does it happen on a surface? And why is it that this chemistry is working? It also works on platinum, for example. Okay, so uh, not with, I mean, you don't need light in that case, but platinum is, is not useful if you're an engineer, okay? Um, anyway, so let's just look at a couple of these things. So John Keith, my former postdoc, now an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh, just did a, a tour de force set of calculations looking at how to, you know, using either DFT B3 lip or coupled cluster, very serious coupled cluster calculations, for a whole series, 22 different substituted pyridiniums um, to take the pyridinium cation and go to a, a, a pyridine or a substituted pyridine, how well versus experiment um, can we calculate the, um, the deprotonation free energies in solution? And, you know, you see they're all around 5 to 10 um, uh, 5 to 10 kilocalories per mole, first of all. And you can see that, in fact, the, the, you know, we can actually do it to within a, a kilocalorie or two, which is pretty amazing. Okay? So with that as a validation, what we then did is to go look at pyridinyl. That's what we really cared about. And nobody's measured the, the deprotonation free energies for pyridinyl. So, but based on this accuracy, we're assuming that if we do coupled cluster or B3-lip, they're going to be pretty good. And this is, this is the, uh, you know, the same kind of data set. And you don't have to look at all the numbers except to notice the scale. Notice that this is about 40 kilocalories per mole. Okay? There is no way that at room temperature you're going to see pyridinyl deprotonate to do this. Okay? It's just not going to happen, not in solution. So the question is, can, can we even make it? Now we've shown it's not going to deprotonate. I'm sort of doing this backwards. I should first say, can we make it? So what John did was to calculate, again using um, free energies, the 
reduction potential to, to take either uh, as a function of pH in the presence of, of solvated protons and electrons to, to form pyridineal from, pyri from uh, pyridine or to start with pyridinium and add an electron to make pyridinyl. Okay, and the, the crossing point uh, of these two lines gives you the calculated pKa, which is very close to the experiment. And so, but the only thing that matters here is notice that these are very uh, negative reduction potentials. And then here's the experiment. Okay, so the experiment is, all, is, the experiment is different from our calculation by 0.9 volts. So you could say, oh, you don't know how to do theory. Right? That's one, that's one conclusion, that we're just idiots. And, um, and, and so the question is, is there a problem with the model or in the interpretation of the measurement? So then you know, John went and looked up other data for other, other pyridiniums uh, and, and basically showed that in, in a bunch of other cases, red is experiment, black is, is, uh, is the calculation. We are able, within 0.1 to 0.2 volts, uh, okay, this one 0 .3, 0 0.35 volts, but the point, no, actually, what am I saying? This is very close. So point, within, uh, within 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 volts, we actually can calculate the, uh, these very well. The only one that is way off is this one. And notice the difference. This is the unsubstituted. These are substituted. These will not absorb well on a surface, okay? This, this will absorb on a surface because it's not, it's not substituted. And so basically, what we think is that we calculated it in solution, and the, and the bottom line is that, um, is that this measurement is really reflective of something happening on the electrode surface. It's not happening. Homogeneous pyridinyl is not the active catalyst. Okay, so I see that I'm, um, I am out of time, and I've uh, barely begun this story, but so what that means is that I'm going to skip to the end because I don't like being obnoxious um, and going over time. And so what I can tell you is that, in, is that the abstract has in it um, lots of, of details about uh, uh, lots of references that you can read. And I'm just going to summarize. And uh, so I hope what I've shown you is that you know, we can learn a lot using quantum mechanics. You have to use a, a wide variety of methods. I've talked about many of them. Um, What's come out of this work on the metal oxides is, is I, I would say, several design principles for solar energy conversion. You know, one is essentially this idea of tuning the band gap and the band edges using closed or half-filled shell metal cations that won't trap, um, uh, that won't trap carriers. Uh, and then, um, uh, and that's essentially saying something similar, or to suppress vacancies. And I didn't really discuss the details of this, but it's really the balance of the stability of these intermediates on the surface that are necessary for water oxidation. You need to, to tune those well. Um, and then I, I did show you at least a little bit to show that the reaction um, of this CO2 reduction chemistry does not involve the homogeneous, um, homogeneously solvated pyridinyl. And what I didn't have time to show you is that we think that it's possible that Dihydro dihydropyridine plays an important role. And also in the work that Ana Munoz Garcia did, um, that I didn't have time to show you, that in fact water in contact with gallium phosphide produces hydritic um, hydrides that absorb onto phosphorus on that surface. And we think that could be also very key to the chemistry. So with that, um, this is the, the current group. Ana's not in this picture because she's been gone for a while, uh, but, but she is listed she is listed here. And so with that, uh, I'm sorry I went over, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Carter, for this wonderful presentation. Is there any? Yeah. Yes, very nice talk. Uh, I have a question and a comment. The, the question is, you've shown uh, the copper 2 wall, the vacancy has a very detrimental role in the process, and I cannot agree more. Uh, in the previous examples, like iron oxide, you dope with a variety of transition metals, and usually these transition metals can take a charge, which is not a charge of a cation they replace. And you need vacancies or defects to compensate the charge. Did you take that into account in uh. this... Uh, plot that you have shown. So, uh, 
So here we did not, it's a very good question, Jim Franco, and in that study we did not look at uh, vacancy defects. We only looked at substitution, and you're absolutely right that the, that the, um, the charge that it takes can vary, and we analyzed in that paper uh, what charge it does take. It doesn't necessarily adopt the, the, uh, a plus three charge like the hematite, okay? So you're right, I mean, that's a follow-up study should look at that. So we didn't do it in that case. Uh, the comment is very short. I mean, you mentioned, and it's also correct, that if you do an hybrid calculation, this costs 100 times the normal DFT calculation. But this is true only if you use, use a plane wave basis set. Because if you use a, a localized atomic orbital basis like, set like in the crystal code, this is no longer true. The cost is more or less the same. Well, that's good. Then, then you have to just worry about whether or not you really have a converged basis set. Yeah, but that, that is well under control, I can say. I mean, uh, there are some people from in Torino, so I, they know better than me, but I mean, that is well under control for these materials. Okay. I think it would have to really be tested, and maybe it has been tested, and I don't know. Okay. Because certainly, even for molecules, it's very hard to converge a Gaussian basis set. Okay. Whereas with a plane wave basis set, I can't believe I'm arguing this, but anyway, uh, a plane wave basis set, it's easy to converge, right? And I agree, it's a stupid basis set, but it is easy to converge, you know. Well, that's impressive. Yeah. You, you mentioned the fact that it is indeed a problem, uh, the combination of efficiency between carrier and hall. Is there a way in which you can measure directly? Because really, this is a transition moment in the situation. You can also estimate that versus the time, knowing the usual parameters of the combination. So, have you looked into that? So, uh, so yes, under certain circumstances, people have been able to measure the electron hole, hole pair lifetime. It, it can be measured, and uh, and we have we have calculated. Yes, we we have done it not in the not in the um, in the periodic calculations, but in our embedded cluster calculations, we have in fact calculated mobilities and electron hole pair lifetimes. Yeah, excited state lifetimes. We've done that, and compared to experiment. So how does that scale with the parameters? Uh, I think we should talk, let's, let's talk about that later because it's a more involved, yeah. Okay, so let's thank again Professor Carpenter.